Today's topic, today's sermon is, Why Argue with Jesus? Why Argue with Jesus? There was, uh, Apostle Paul tells a, tells a story of how he met Jesus Christ. He was, before he was an apostle, before he was a Christian even, he was uh, very passionate about stamping out Christianity. And he had done a lot of damage in, in Jerusalem and, and in the area around there. So he was going north to, to Syria. He was on the road to Damascus, the, the city in Syria. And on that road, he met the resurrected Jesus Christ. And Paul reports that one of the things that, that Jesus told Paul was, Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? Uh, the goads are, uh, if you have a team of oxen or something, you're plowing a field, you'd have this, this wooden bar behind them, you try to keep them, you goad them to keep them going the right direction, and sometimes they'd get angry and they'd kick against it, but they just end up hurting themselves. Have you ever found yourself in that position where you get angry and you kick against God and you're really only hurting yourself? Why would you argue with Jesus? He loves us. He died for us. He's opened up heaven's doors for us. And uh, I find that in my life, when I'm arguing with God, I'm, I mean, this is obvious, I'm always wrong. When, when I try to, to debate God in my mind or, or put God off, I'm, I'm always wrong. In chapter 22, we're going to see an epic confrontation played out. Uh, but it's not with... Uh, it's not with swords, it's not with weapons. It's this huge confrontation as the Jewish leadership tries to sidetrack Jesus' ministry. So remember, Jesus came into Jerusalem and the crowds were all celebrating. It was a big deal. Uh, he comes, he clears out. The next day he comes and clears out the, the temple from all the people who were cheating, the people who were, who were coming there during Passover. Uh, this is the countdown, Christ's final days here. And uh, the Jewish leadership is afraid of Jesus' popularity, of the attention he's getting. In the center of the chosen land, right in Jerusalem, right in Herod's huge grand temple, this wonder of the world, the brightest and best that society had to offer decide, decide to take Jesus on, head on. They want to take him down in front of the crowds. They want to take away his, his influence, his power, his authority. The intellectual elite, the political elite, the cultural cream of the crop opposed Jesus. Totally unlike the way our culture is today. Uh, no, there's, there's something often, isn't there, where the Bible says, Jesus said it was hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. There's something about power in influence and money that makes us despise God even more. And the intellectual, the, the movers and shakers, if, if you're an, uh, an artiste, you want to, to shape culture, you want to have an influence on, on culture, and then you've got God over here who's saying, okay, now here's the way we do it. Po politician, artist, you know, intelligentsia, there's, there's a vested interest in opposition to God because his influence is vying with your uh, sphere of influence. And so the cream of the crop, not the usual people, not the common people, not the poor, the cream of the crop had set themselves opposed to Jesus Christ. And you've got to ask yourself, why? What were they, what were they going to get out of this in, in, you know, in a long-term point of view? Because God's always trying to help us to think long-term. Remember Christ said, what, is it, what does it matter if you gain the whole world and lose your very soul? Good question, isn't it? What would it matter ultimately if you gain the whole world and lose your very soul? I'm going to take some time now. We're going to read together the entire chapter 22 of Matthew. If you haven't turned there yet, go ahead and do so. It's good to familiarize yourself with the Bible. Sometimes the, the phones are too easy and, and you can't really get there. Uh, as you read along, I hope that you get a sense of this high drama, this tension uh, this, the theater of this confrontation between Jesus and these captains of culture, the, the, the top, the brightest and best of society, right in front of the crowds, right in the temple, people from all over the known world gathered for Passover. 
Some of them are wondering who this brash young teacher is. Uh, others are excited because he, he took on the money changers. They had come to worship God and they got ripped off right in God's house. And here this, this young teacher, this young rabbi comes and he, he's throwing over tables. And it, it felt good, like justice. We want to see justice. So people are, have their eyes on Jesus. They're wondering. Others had been with him, had seen him do miracles, had, had seen his potential and, and come there. And still others want to make him king. Like in the Old Testament, God would raise up these, these, these messiahs, raise up saviors, raise up people who would, who would push back uh, the Philistines or, or push, push back the, the Midianites or push back the, uh, you know, all the different countries that would come against. God would, the people would repent. God would raise somebody up and he'd push back the, the enemy. And there were people who thought, okay, Jesus is obviously a prophet. Check. He's going to push back the Romans. And they desperately wanted to see, just like in the Old Testament, they wanted to see God's uh, with him. He's doing these miracles. We want to make him king so that he'll drive out the Roman Empire and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. So there's all these things going on. Meanwhile, Jesus, even more than his apostles, even though he's talking to his apostles, they weren't getting it, Jesus knows that he's on his way to the cross. And we know it too because we know how the story ends. So we're reading here. It adds a sense of urgency to the text. His time is short Jesus needs to build up his followers. He needs to give the disciples what they're going to need to be able to turn the world on its head. And incidentally, that's exactly what happened. A few followers of Jesus Christ, when he died, he hadn't traveled far from his birthplace. He never wrote a book. He was not a military leader. But a few, uh, within the generation after his death, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, that all over the world, people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Things, he had this huge flip. And Jesus needs to instill in his followers what they need to know to be able to go forward. So, so he's got that on his plate. And, and Jesus is, is not playing Mr. Nice Guy. He's not being politically correct. He's going right at the false assumptions of his foes, the people have, who've lined themselves against him. He needs, to, uh, he needs to challenge their misunderstanding of him so that they will have a chance to go to heaven. He needs to challenge it because their ideas about God, their ideas about himself are incorrect. He's, he, this is the final days of his ministry, and he has to live in such a way that it's going to be recorded by right Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He's going to live his life in such a way that when the record of it is written, this record is going to be read in every single generation since that time. This record is going to go from from this little outpost on the eastern corner of the Roman Empire to the islands of the Pacific, to the deepest jungles of South America, all over Africa, all over the known world. Uh, so portions of it today are translated into almost every single language that, that is still in use today. The story of Jesus is going to go out. He has a lot on his plate. This is a huge moment in history, and he needs to use these days, this time, uh, wisely. So uh, here we are today, and we're going to be reading about this, uh, these, this dramatic encounter in the temple. All these elements are in play. Christ had several years of public ministry, uh, and everything now is coming to a head. Everything is, is coming to a dramatic point. So let's read. And I know we read part of this a couple weeks ago, but we're going to just refresh ourselves to, for context. Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell them, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. Remember, there's different excuses people have for not receiving the call that God gives them. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready 
but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed that a man uh, that was there who was not wearing the wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. The king told the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. So Jesus gives this story, this parable about the wedding banquet. Anybody can come. The good is well bet. Anybody can come and be blessed. Jesus is going to provide the wedding clothes. God provides the salvation. Anybody can come. God's love is available. This feast this blessing of being part of God's family, it's available for anybody. And the response of the Pharisees is not, wow, I want some of those wedding clothes. I want to be at that banquet. I want to be a part of what God is doing. The response is, we've got to stop this guy. He's ridiculous. We need to oppose him. We need to try and trap him in his words. And they set up, uh, and again, familiarity greatest enemy of scripture their trap is actually brilliant it is worthy of brilliant men this is a really sharp trap but again their thinking was not is this the message of god if it is how should i respond to it their thinking was how can i derail this how can i go around it how can i trap jesus their thinking was not trying to find truth their thinking was how to defeat jesus so the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now the Herodians and the Pharisees were enemies. The Herodians were part of the establishment. They were connected to the royal family. They actually liked working with the Roman Empire because King Herod was close with the emperor. They liked working with the Roman Empire. They were rich to do that. They liked the standard, uh, the, the stay things as they were, the standard quo. The Pharisees were, were, uh, they were more like patriots. They wanted Rome out of there. They wanted uh, you know, Israel for the, for the Israelites. They, they, they were really anti the Roman Empire. But now they've found themselves common cause. These nasty guys found that suddenly they're getting along because they're both attacking Jesus. So they sent their disciples along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Oh, my goodness. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. What, what nasty people. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, Muslims or, or uh, avowed atheists will, will say, Pastor Dan. We know, you know, and I, I tell them, listen, I ain't your pastor and I ain't your daddy. You know, if you don't want me to lead you anywhere, then I could not be called your shepherd. And these people, he was, Jesus was not their teacher. They were mocking him. They were, they were trying to set him up. They were smooth talking him. And I was reading as I was studying for this text that there's an Italian proverb that uh, he who, who strokes you more than he, uh, usual either is lying to you or about to lie to you. And that's exactly what they were doing to Jesus Christ right now. Uh, if they're interested in truth, why do they have to play the games? If you find yourself in a position where you're game playing, maybe you ain't searching for truth. Just going to toss that out there. Teacher. We know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention. You're not, you're not swayed by opinion or, or who's rich or popular. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Brilliant trap. If he just says no, uh, the, crowds, the crowds want him, by the way, to say no, we're not going to pay that tax. 
The crowd wants him to be firebrand. The crowd wants him to rebel against Rome. And uh, if he does that, the Herodians will have a right to arrest him as, as a <coughs> rabble rouser. If he says, no, we, we, have to, we have to obey the rules, people are going to say, well, wait a second. He's, he's really not uh, going to be the savior for us. He's, 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 just, uh, he's just going along. He's just part of, the, he's part of the system. He wants to find his place to sit, fit in. He can fit in uh, as long as he doesn't bother the government. Maybe he can make his buck too. So it was a brilliant trap. The crowds are watching, and Jesus can't win. Whatever he says, he can't win. Well, Jesus, because he was so, uh, you know, he had these big doe eyes. You know, he was just such a cutie, and he was so warm and fuzzy. He said, oh, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? No. He said, you hypocrites. Why did he call them hypocrites? Because they were being hypocritical. They were pretending like they respected him. They did not have an ounce of respect for him. If you are pretending, again, if you are game playing, maybe you're a hypocrite. Maybe, maybe there is something wrong. Maybe you're really not as enlightened as you think you are. Maybe you're not seeking after truth. Again, challenge yourself with that. You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Good question. Are we having an intellectual discussion? Are we trying to arrive at truth? Or are we playing games? Because it looks like you're playing games. You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked him, whose image is on this, and whose inscription? Uh, it would have been a Tiberius Caesar at that time. Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God. Throughout the scriptures, by the way, Christians are commanded to be good citizens. We're told to obey the law of the land. In the Old Testament, uh, even when they were taken as captives and brought to a foreign country, God told them, set up businesses, be a good neighbor, uh, let people see that you're my people. In the New Testament, we're supposed to pay our tax. We're supposed to be good citizens. We're supposed to obey the law. Now, when that command was given, People say, well, okay, I'll obey the law as long as is the, is the government is not involved in something nasty. When that was written, the government was involved in genocide. The Roman Empire would wipe out cultures and civilizations, and your tax money went to that. God says, obey the government. When do you don't obey the government? When you directly, you directly are prevented from being obedient to God. And then you say, who do you think it's right for me to obey, God or you, a mere mortal? And then you take your whooping, just like the apostles did before the Sanhedrin. Obey the government. But if they ever tell you you can't talk about Jesus, you can't pray, you can't do, you, you say, no, 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 no. You're not the boss over me. God is my king. God and God alone. So yes, Christians, be a good citizen. Uh, you're commanded to be good citizens. Go out there and be a blessing to the culture. Be a blessing to your neighbors. The gospel is an affront to people. The gospel is offended, offensive. The gospel, the cross, says get on your knees before God. You can't cut it. Let's let the gospel offend. We don't need to be the ones that are so nasty and offensive all the time. Obey the government, be a good citizen, pay your taxes. Early on in the history of our church, I got a phone call and some people wanted to meet with me. They wanted to maybe connect and join up with our church. Two groups, they had a group meeting together, and they asked some questions, and we were pretty close together theologically. And they said, they said you don't believe in paying taxes, do you? I said, you bet I do. And they said, maybe we can't fellowship, and I think that'd probably be a good idea. <laughs> We thought, no, I don't, I don't think you're going to be very comfortable with this because we believe in obeying the, the authority that God's put over us. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, knowing their evil intent, what is this game playing? It's evil. It's wicked. It's sinful. Nothing righteous or good or noble about it. You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used to pay the tax brought him a denarius, and he asked uh, whose image is on it. And uh, they said the P 
pyramid with an all-seeing eye of Horus. I don't know. What does that mean? Uh, but whose image is that? And in whose inscription? It was Tiberius Caesar. And uh, then he said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. That, they had a brilliant trap and they didn't like his answer. He didn't play, he didn't play with them. He didn't play the game. Uh, that same day, the Sadducees, who, who were probably very happy to see the uh, Pharisees get shot down because they, were, they didn't like each other at all, Pharisees got shot down, so now it's their chance to look like big deals in front of the crowd. Uh, so the same day, the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, that's why they're sad, you see, yep, uh, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, again, teacher, oh, teacher. Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. This was for laws of inheritance so that the, the property could stay in the family. Now, there were seven brothers among us. I don't know if this actually happened or if they're making this up. Uh, they really want to make a point here. There were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right down to the seventh brother. Finally, the woman died. You could tell they're getting smug. They're getting happy about this question. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife should she be of the seven? Since all of them will be married to her. Uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. Again, it's a trick. It's a trap. Jesus replied, uh, very politically incorrect. Uh, he said, you guys are in error because you don't know the scriptures. You're asking something like that because you don't know your Bible. If you knew your Bible, you wouldn't ask such a silly question. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. These were religious people who denied big chunks of the Bible. We've got a lot of folks that do that today. Uh, say they're religious, say they're spiritual, but reject uh, big chunks of the scriptures. Jesus says, you don't know your Bible. You don't know the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Incidentally, the, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in angels either. So Jesus Christ is speaking with authority. He's not even defending this right now. He's just, he's just speaking as authority source. I, I come from heaven. Here's the, here's the deal. Here's it is. The angels in heaven, they don't marry. But about the resurrection of the dead, and now he could have quoted from all over the Old Testament at this point. Instead, he goes to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch, because the Sadducees pretty much rejected everything after the, after the, the Torah. So he goes right to the Torah. <coughs> it says, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham. I am the self-existent one, the eternal one. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jacob, he is not the God of the dead, but he, the God of the living. And the point is, God didn't say, I was Abraham's God. I was Isaac's God. I was Jacob's God. God said, no, I am presently the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So it's interesting that when the Pharisees were defeated, they, they were, uh, ran away with their tails between their legs. But here we see it's the crowd that was astonished. The, Pharisees, the Sadducees very likely did not concede anything. Ah, ah, pointless. It doesn't matter. Uh, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. So now we have a lawyer. And guess what? The lawyer actually comes out looking the best of all. So we can, we can uh, set aside the lawyer jokes at this time. Teacher, and by the way, this fellow meant it. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? They're looking at Jesus answer so wonderfully all these questions, and they, they have a question now. Jesus replied, the greatest commandment, what would you think it would be if you never read your Bible, if you never heard this story? The greatest commandment, thou shalt not. I mean, everybody's got their pet commandment. In America, our, our greatest commandment is thou shalt not judge uh, unless you're like me, and then we can judge everybody who's different. Uh, 
you know, we have these ideas in cult, we have these ideas in culture. Thou shalt not talk about religion. Where is that written, by the way? Who, who, on whose authority? Oh, that's your opinion? Oh, thank you for sharing. I've got a different opinion. Is that okay? You know, uh, we have these thou shalt that hold so much sway in our culture. So Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And by the law, we're talking about the, the Torah again, the first five books. Jesus replied, the greatest is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Pretty much everything you got. Love God. God is goodness. When we love God, we become more like him. Everything good and beautiful and pure and, and lovely and holy is, is from God. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor. Literal, it means literally near one. Love your near one as yourself. And then Jesus says, all the law and the prophets, everything that came after the Torah, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love other people. That's what it's all about. All of this is exposing, is expanding on those truths. Love God. There is such a thing as goodness. It's not an accident. It's not something culture made up. There's goodness, there's truth, there's beauty. Love God and love other people. What else is there? What, what, what could be higher than that? What could be more important than that? <coughs> so Jesus answers this question. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus took this opportunity. He asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Good question. He's standing right in front of them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. In a sense, they were right, uh, physically, by, uh, you know, that the line of David coming down through Joseph and Mary, by the way. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, calls him Lord? So David calls his descendant Lord, for he says, The Lord, and here we have Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet, this is a, <coughs> this is a, I can't remember, I didn't write it down, can you believe it? I think it's Psalm 110. It, it's, a, it's a psalm that's about the Messiah, and it's also a very, very scary verse, and Jesus is applying it to himself. The Lord said to my Lord, David said, God said to my Lord, uh, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet, and Jesus is applying this text to himself. The rest of the text goes on to say, that this Lord, this Messiah, is going to crush the king's heads, put the nations under his boot. There will be piles of dead bodies around him. And Jesus is standing in the temple saying, this applies to me. And they all knew it. Jesus is scary. Better get right with me. This has come to Jesus' time. I'm going to... Uh, the enemies of Jesus will be put under his boot. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be called his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. What an incredible, dramatic scene we see. Uh, when people say, C.S. Lewis had a great line. C.S. Lewis, was a, was a, his, his area of study was actually mythology. He loved to study mythology. He said, when people say that the Gospels are, are like mythology, they're doing a great injustice to mythology. <laughs> they don't understand it. The two are totally different. The way they're written, uh, this is not the way you would write something. If, uh, if you were uh, talking about a myth and, and a sword pulled out of a stone or, or getting a golden fleece or all these different kinds of stories, this is a battle between uh, ideas in this, in this debate here in the, in the center of the temple in front of all of these people it reads more like something that happened and was recorded, doesn't it? And, and it doesn't read at all. None of the book of Matthew reads at all. And I'm harping on this again, okay? Because it's out there. That Christianity is a Greek invention. And for some reason, the Greeks who were prestigious were trying to convince the Romans who ruled the world and the Persians who had this great culture and Egyptians... You know that culture that everybody despises? We're going to invite a, make a religion 
and your Savior comes from the Jews, and you've got to bow to him. So that doesn't make any sense. Set that aside for a moment. The book of Matthew is written in a Jewish context. Everything about it is Jewish. The debate's going on here. The different factions are all Jewish. Why in the world would Greeks invent a Savior? And, and yet, you can find guys on the news, on television, all the time espousing that. And I want to wonder why. Just reject Jesus the way he's promoted here. Just say, yeah, this is what the Bible says, and I don't believe it. Why try to make it into some fantasy that he's not? Is the real Jesus too scary? Why not reject Jesus as history brings him to us? Why do you have to make up some idea of Jesus to reject? Some straw man, something that's obviously inaccurate. Again, if you're playing all these games, maybe truth is not what you're after. Please consider that. Why argue with Jesus? The Pharisees... Conservative patriots, anti-Roman rule, traditionalists tried to take Jesus down. They didn't want the living God in their equation. They were able to control culture uh, through tradition, through their ways. The Herodians, the political insiders, had their fingers on the heartbeat of the nation, attached to the royal family, didn't have room in their plans for a savior. And the Sadducees, the liberal elite, they denied so much of Scripture, the, the movers and shakers, the people that mattered. The last thing on their minds was they wanted to humble themselves before the Messiah. They could not see. Right in front of them was love incarnate. God put on flesh. Right in front of them, love came. Jesus was there to bless them. Jesus was there to save their behinds from the fires of hell. Jesus was there to forgive them of everything. Jesus was there to, to give them joy and peace and, and, to, and to help them escape from having to posture and win influence by manipulation and all these, all these dead ends that, that wrap us up. Jesus was there to save them. They missed it. The answer to everything right before them, they missed it. Because instead of trying to see it with clear eyes, because instead of trying to find truth, they wanted to find a reason to evade God. <coughs> Excuse me. They were looking for ways to ridicule. They wanted to mock. It made them feel good. They wanted to sit in the seat of scoffers. They wanted to ridicule. They thought, sought out clever ways to entrap Jesus, but to what end? What could they possibly have gotten out of it? Just a, oh, you really got him. The, the people who think just like you, clapping you on the back, they only hurt themselves, love incarnate, right before them, a way out, right before them, salvation, right before them, eternal life, right there. When the, Bi when the Bible says that hell is a place of, gnashing of teeth and regret it's right there forgiveness was right there and i missed it they only hurt themselves their hard hearts became only harder when jesus tried to love them when jesus didn't respond and play the game the way they wanted him to but one man was different i talked about the lawyer right one man was different he seems to have asked a real question because he really wanted to hear uh, Christ's answer to this important question. He wasn't trying to look impressive or use word games to win in the eyes of some of his peers. He simply came to Christ and asked a deep, vital question. And by the way, it's really okay to ask God questions. It's really okay to come with God with our doubts. He's a big boy. He's not offended. Come to God with our questions. What is the greatest commandment in the law? And I want us now to turn to the book of Mark. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 12 from verse 28. <clears throat> Mark chapter 12, <clears throat> 28 to 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? 
The most important one answered Jesus is this, and here Mark, the shorter gospel, actually expands on it, and that's, that's interesting. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, said the man replied. You are right in saying God is one and there is no one other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw him, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And when I say that or you say that, it's different than when Jesus says it. When God in the flesh says, that's a wonderful thing. You're not far. You almost, you almost have it. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus was there not to make the Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians uh, embarrassed, although he was, no, he was fine with that, because uh, the crowds needed to be uh, you know, uh, di disabused. They needed to have their feelings and opinions about uh, these people as teachers removed because they were false teachers. But Jesus was there to bring people close to the kingdom of God. And when somebody came with an honest question because they were seeking truth and they heard the response from Jesus, they got closer. What's in it? Why argue with Jesus? Love incarnate. How about you and I? Many of us Christians, some of us maybe watching on the internet or television or, or even here this morning, aren't sure yet, don't know yet, or maybe, maybe have been keeping God at arm's length. Even as Christians, you know, we can miss Jesus' will for our lives. We can miss God's, God's intent for our lives. Friends, are we going to miss out? Are we going to miss Jesus? The Pharisees and the Sadducees missed. They missed it. They had the opportunity standing before them. They missed Jesus because they saw him as a threat to their lifestyle. I've had people with tears in their eyes tell me, I'll become a Christian before I die. But I don't want to now, because I don't want God to tell me how to live. More than a few times people have told me that. Because deep down in their heart, they know it's true. But they know also it's true that God interferes. And if you get too close to him, he's going he's gonna to mess things up. He, he's a threat to our lifestyles. He's the threat to our, 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 our self-perceived box. We all put ourselves in a box. Oh, this and nothing more. God says, I think you need, I think I'm need to break this box. And now that's not comfortable anymore. What's going to happen next? Can I trust this guy to do something with my life? Well, he died for you, brothers and sisters, friends. He died for you. Yeah, you can trust him. Nobody loves you more. He's the creator. He made you. And he made you special and beautiful, and God has, God has a good plan for you. He's going to do good things with your life. The Pharisees and the Sadducees mixed it up because they saw Jesus as a threat. A threat definitely to our sense of self-importance. If I get close to the king, I can't pretend that I'm the king anymore. If I put my back to the king, I can pretend like I get to call all the shots. I define what's right and wrong. You look at God and you realize what a, what a crock that is. No, I guess I don't. They stood in the presence of one who had formed galaxies and who had come for them, was willing to be beaten up and spit on and rejected just to uplift them, to ennoble, them, ennoble their lives. Because, why did he come? Because, because, why was he there? Because he loved them. And they were looking for every opportunity to escape. Looking for every excuse they could find. Most of them missed it. Today, pride and personal agendas can still keep us from seeing and knowing and loving God as well. And that would be tragic. God is the source, the source of goodness, love, life. Don't miss out. Wherever you're at in life, whatever you're going through, whatever you've come through, whatever past you have, no matter what you're in right now, this is come to Jesus time. This is come to Jesus' time. Why argue with God? 
What's it done for you? How does it work out? For myself, whenever I fight against God, it doesn't work out so well. What we're going to do right now is, is just pray together. And I want to invite you, again, no matter where you're at, watch on television, watch on the Internet, just bow your heads with me right now. Together, we're going to talk with God. I ask you, this is not magic. Prayer is not magic. There's a Father in heaven who loves you, and he wants you to talk with him. So in your heart, just repeat the words after me. Direct your hearts towards the Lord. And we're going to fix this salvation thing right now. We're going to get right with God. And then you can, you can read your Bible, get into a church. You can get with God's people and start learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what it looks like to follow him each and every day of your lives. Let's, let's just pray together right now and make this real. Dear Lord God, thank you for being so good. God, thank you for caring about me. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to take responsibility for my sins, to pay for my sin, my hard-headedness, my selfishness on the cross. Lord, I want to confess to you. I want to repent, Lord. I want to admit, Lord, I'm far from perfect. I, I've said things and done things so selfish, so hurtful to the people around me. Lord God, and I'm sorry. And today I admit your ways, they're just better than my ways. You're so good. And I want to follow you. Now, I don't want to argue with you anymore. I'm going to put down the, the, the mocking and the, and the excuse making and the running from you. Lord, show me what it means to follow you every day. Lord, I surrender to you because I want to surrender to this, this beauty and this goodness, this love that you are. Lord, please cleanse me, make me into a new person. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being a God of love. Thank you for your forgiveness. I pray all of these things, God, and I'm just simply trusting that your love is true and that this forgiveness you offer in the Bible is true too, Lord. I want to be with you every day, Lord. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.